I'm Kevin Durham and this is Celebs Doing Stuff That They Like. This is the series where we interview celebrities while doing something that they really enjoy. Today's guest is Milton Jones. Milton won the Perrier Award for Best Newcomer in 1996, but his career really took off when he became a regular on BBC's Mock the Week. Milton loves his fish and chips, so we've come to Golden Union in the West End to give him his favourite meal. So they good fish and chips, they bad yeah, fish and chips. Good. Help yourself, help yourself. Uh, Mark's out a table for the fish and chips? Um, I haven't had the fish yet, so that I'll have to wait. Certainly, upper rate. Upper rate fish and chips, mm. non greasy fish and chips. Mm. Do you know what I always really hate about takeaways? When you walk in, and then almost immediately they say, What do you want? Yeah. You haven't looked at the menu, you haven't given any thought, you haven't had time to think. This time, sit down, look at the menu. Choose what you want, yeah, yeah. and you don't get grease all over your face. Also, um, the chips are near us. Sometimes the chips are brilliant, and other times it's clearly the end of the oil or something. And you almost go in and have a look. No, I'll be back in ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> or do you ever buy it and then get home and then look at the paper and it's almost see-through from the sheer amount of grease? Those are the worst fish and chips. Yeah. Um, it's all about you, not fish and chips. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, and I didn't know until I was doing my research that you are, you consider yourself a born again Christian. Now there's a lot of uh, new comedians coming out now on the circuit and it seems like every new comedian has a bit on being an atheist. So when you hear something like, like that, does that pee you off or do you get annoyed, do you have arguments over it? It depends what they're saying. If, as you're suggesting, it's the latest fad and there isn't any real thought behind it, then I don't have much respect for it. However, some people, for thinking through issues, and that, that's great. I often have long conversations with Robin Ince and people like that, you know. And we're both open to the idea that we might not be completely right about everything. Yeah. Which is kind of a key thing, I think. Um, yeah, so it depends what they're saying, I think. So what, what would make you angry? What would make you kind of mad? If they just like literally ripped into religion, said anyone who believes it is a knobhead? Would that kind of... Yeah, I mean, that would... Yes, I think that is the thing, actually. Just dismissing 2,000 years of sincerity and martyrdom. Uh-huh. No bits. <laughs> hang on a minute, hang, hang on. Hang on, hold your horses. Yeah, yeah. So, exactly what are you offering in replacement of this, is it? Because otherwise I'm thinking maybe you're the knobhead. Yeah, yeah. you're the knob, knob, knobhead's over there, not, mm. not here. Um, in fact, you could argue that um, to have a faith is true alternative, rather than... Uh, but there are plenty of people... What I find is that a lot of people do have a faith, it's just not stuck in organised religion. And either it's uh, maybe it's a different religion or a version, either people have been to church and didn't like it or whatever it is, and um, had something go wrong and have had to sort of make their own faith or have their own way of seeing things. And, you know, in a way, church is just like a gym. And it doesn't make you fit in itself. Yeah. It's just useful if you can use it. Yeah, a less sweaty gym. Yeah, a less sweaty gym. Although, I've just come back from Uganda. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right, so, yeah, it's no use if you just stay and show off to the other members. Anyway, yeah. you actually should be preparing yourself for going out and doing some team thing somewhere. Sure. So, don't get me started. <laughs> so, what's the biggest argument that you've had with someone over religion? Have you had like an all-out no, blazing I've never had, No, because... I wouldn't say arguments. I've had discussions. In fact, um, I did uh, Richard Bacon show on Radio 5, um, and we were talking about something else. Uh -huh. and and he said something about Christianity, and I said, well, I'm a Christian. And there was like a, a gap of about 20 seconds on there before he said, you're a what? <laughs> <laughs> Awkward pause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I explained to him, and, and then he listed all the bad things the church has done, which is, you know, irrefutable in one way. Uh, and what do you do in that position? Do you, do you feel like you want to walk out of that show? Because obviously if you walked out, that's yeah. going to be bad. bad no, I know him, and, you know, he's get on perfectly well with him. But he just he didn't know. <laughs> so, um, but in a way, I have to say, well, okay, you have those opinions, whoever you are, say, of slagging off Christianity. What are you replacing it with? And you clearly uh, believe in good and evil. Why? 
if you don't have a faith of any kind, if you have no absolute to trace it back to, you know, how are you thinking your life will work out or be measured or what happens when you die? What did he say? Did he come out with an answer? No, no, I can't remember. I'm sure he went into adverts. <laughs> it's strange because there aren't any on BBC Five. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. Just made them up. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on, you're a bit of a dark horse on, oh, yeah. online. I couldn't really find much about your personal life. Really? Yeah, not much. On Wikipedia, you're married, yeah. three kids. That's it, pretty much. It's like two or three lines. So how did you meet your wife? Youth group, years ago. I mean, Christian long- thing. Yeah, it was. It was, and uh, uh, that's how I met my kids as well. <laughs> <laughs> you'll do, you'll do. Uh-huh. Uh, no, a long time ago, and yeah, we've been together ever since. And is she a big fan of comedy as well, or is she a polar opposite? Does she still find you funny? You'd have to ask her that question. Uh-huh. All my kids and my wife have my jokes tested out on them, so they're very dismissive about what they don't like. Uh-huh. But there are things they really do like. So, the fans of Modern Family say the, um, what's it called, um, the Hoof Family thing, the... Uh, hey. Anyway, it's an American thing. The American thing. So we like, it t- tends to be American stuff, actually. So it's Cheers or Frasier. And, uh, yeah, they, uh, but also they get free tickets to stuff, so they can't complain to... <laughs> Do they still find you funny or do they groan a bit when you, they, they see their old man get on stage? Their default position is, that's not funny, Dad. <laughs> it doesn't deter me, though. Because yeah. I know if I do make them laugh, then that actually is quite funny. Uh-huh. So, and also what they do now, they don't... They, they know that jokes are money, essentially. So they say, how much is this one worth, Dad? And they... Oh, so they've got a little business going on yeah. with you right now. Yeah. Do they ever write any jokes that you use, though? Or they do you have just humor them. I have done over the years, my son, uh, when he was only nine years old, he said, uh, Dad, why don't you write a sketch um, with about a football commentator who says it's really easy to commentate because their names are all on their teeth, their shirts, uh-huh. and then do it, uh, and Vodafone, passes to Vodafone, passes to Vodafone, it's a nice little sketch. He also came up with, um, is it just me or does the Queen's face look like a coin? <laughs> I've heard you do that one before that sounds like something you've probably done on stage so I used it yeah and paid him 10p <laughs> bit cheap but there you go do they want to be entertainers as well they want to follow in your footsteps my wife's an artist and two of them are very good graphic designery people my eldest son I think he wants to be a writer Comedy he, writer, or I don't know. I'm not sure what he he, he doesn't even know. He did English at Kent, so um, I think he'll end up doing something like that. But probably not comedy. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe comedy will all implode in the next five years, and there'll be no work for anyone. <laughs> mm-hmm. Were you kind of hoping though, when you were, when they were growing up, that they would kind of follow in your footsteps secretly? Mm-hmm. You kind of wanted them to be a little bit like you get on stage. No, I, I don't think so. Um, because I know it's a hard job and that a lot of people, even though they're really good, have struggled. So I'd much rather than be, find what's in them, in them to do, find out their passion. So you're not a pushy parent? <laughs> no, a little bit pushy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not. So I can't turn around and tell them to get a proper job. Yeah. Just look at me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and in terms of your comedy, I, I'd say you're a fairly safe comedian. Um, like you hardly ever swear. I don't think I've ever heard you say a swear word, even on Mock the Week. Is that because of your kids? Did you want your stuff to be accessible for your kids? Or? Partially. I didn't want anything that I couldn't say to them. Obviously, as a Christian, blasphemy was kind of out. Uh-huh. Even so, I like the idea of everyone being able to get into it. <coughs> Which means now I look out and there are whole families in the audience and it's a, I like that yeah. you know it's almost a pantomime feel to it and there was a tweet I was, I was some, at some venue and I oversaw a tweet saying I'm in a Milton Jones audience on one side there's an old age pensioner on the other side there's a goth and just it's all <laughs> very it's mixed a broad spectrum of yeah, people yeah. that you're, you're yeah. reaching but I quite like that idea 
it also means I can play mainstream Saturday night sort of audiences. Exactly, and that's, that, that must have been part of the equation. You must have thought, yeah, if, if I do the sweary stuff, then I'm just not going to hit the mainstream as well as if I, if yeah. I kept it safe. I mean, it wasn't as well thought out as that, but effectively I wanted to communicate with as many people as possible. And I've always been asked to do other charity things or church things even where just forget doing it, never mind swearing, forget doing anything too niche. You just need to hit as many people as possible. I mean, said that I was in Uganda last week and I was asked to entertain a youth group of people who didn't speak English. Oh, how would you do that with mime? How would you do that? I picked on people in the audience, basically, oh, okay. and said I, and it had to be translated. And it worked for about 10 minutes, but you know, I ended up with questions and answers. <laughs> <laughs> now, I read an article recently where you said, um, 10 years ago, it was a lot easier to get into stand-up comedy. And 10 years ago, it was considered to be uh, more of an alternative. Now it's really mainstream. And it's a lot harder for a stand-up comic to make it now. Yeah, yeah. So, in, in your opinion, what does a, a stand-up comic have to do now to, to break through? Do they have to push it a lot more? Do they have to be instantly funny? As you say, it's more mainstream. And I think it's harder to have an, orig- an original voice. For start, there's so many people doing it. There's so many courses. And inevitably, if you want a course, it may help you in some ways, but you might end up sounding, sounding a bit like your tutor yeah. in terms of your voice. Yeah. So, what I have noticed, I was out in Australia earlier, and there were a few comics who were travelling the world doing three months in Adelaide, Melbourne and Sydney, and then in the remaining nine months fitting those gigs in, in England in, into the rest of it. And I think there's also, I mean, we're a few years off it, but a world circuit developing. Yeah. Not just festivals, but like venues, Moscow, Berlin. I suppose that Eddie Izzard has trailed away in, t- in terms of other languages. Are you tapping into like world circuit? me yeah not really no I mean it's harder for me because of the kids and the family. well no no forget them oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Um, because what I do is word play oh and it might it doesn't translate that well into other countries yeah, yeah. I mean I've got enough to get by would it work in America uh, I've only ever done Montreal and I had to pick and choose my stuff quite carefully so, you know, I can, I can do 15 minutes in Holland and I can do Norway. And, but a lot of the stuff. And just um, work. do you think there's too much stand up on TV now? Do you think there's just. Because almost every other programme is a, a panel show yeah. in, in the evening. Um, I mean, there's always like one prime time channel with a panel show yeah. and then like a rerun channel like Dave or Gold yeah. with a panel show at the same time. Is that just too much? Yes. Yes. There is too much. But I know why there is too much. It's because it's quite economical to put on. It's a person talking, or people talking. And, you know, compared to doing a classic Dickens drama, <laughs> it's so much cheaper. Yeah. So, what I think what is interesting is comics migrating from that to other things. And whether it could be presenting or acting, or, you know, it's a great opportunity for them. Um, but yeah, no, I'm sure in a couple of years the panel games will begin to shut down a bit yeah. and it will go to something else. Oh really, you think it will decline? Well, people are fed up with it. And also, it's just the way art goes, isn't it? It goes in cycles. And then as the next generation comes through, they go, no, this, this is what the last generation did. We want something. Something new, something fresh. Have you ever thought about putting together your own panel show and trying to pitch it? Yeah, but the trouble is, even on Mockery Week, I'm the, the man who does the non sequiturs, the, the crazy neighbour next door. Yeah. So for me to... So I, I should never MC a, a comedy show. I have done. But it's wrong because it gives the whole evening a slightly odd feel. A weird kind of yeah, yeah. clearing. So I, mean, I suppose I could be in a show. It could be like a shooting stars kind of thing where you can really play off the weirdness. Yeah. I can see it working really well. Maybe. I want to cut if that if Yeah, that's yeah, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. a good idea. Um, and in terms of Mock the Week, like I, I interviewed Nina Conti recently. She avoids going on that show because she feels it's too gladiatorial. Everyone's trying to fight for a bit of time, get their, your gag in. Do you actually enjoy going on? I mean, it must be great PR and yeah, yeah. 
I mean, it's probably really kind of helped you launch your career in a whole new direction, but do you yeah. actually enjoy it? Uh, enjoy is the wrong word. Uh, it's a bit like doing an exam. Uh-huh. I mean, well, it literally is in terms of, they give you a list of subjects, but there are way too many subjects to revise. Yeah. So you just revise what you hope will come up. Okay. And uh, I feel conflicted about it because in one way I'm grateful to it because, it's, as you say, it's brought me to a whole new audience. Mm. However, um, it's not an easy show to do and I don't think you'll find anyone who thinks it's an easy show. Everyone gets on fine, it's all, but it's hard work. Yeah. Are you not like driven by fear though when you go on that you might not come up with something either funny or you might just choke a bit? Yeah. And I have done. Mm. Oh, have you? <laughs> I think probably the first couple of times you do it are the hardest. Yeah. Because the audience don't know who you are. Yeah. You don't know if you can do it. Um, but as I say, what's been useful for me is because I do short bits. And if I was a storyteller, it would be a lot harder to get word in. Yeah. Because I, and also, I don't even talk on subject. I just throw in a bomb and get out. Yeah. <laughs> so, in a way, I'm cheating. Um, you ever fallen out with anyone from Mock the Week? No. No, it's not worth it. The, the only frustration is that this... The way it's set up, it's always seven people trying to get through a door for two. And so each time you're trying to get in. Yeah. And so many times I've got something and I can't get in. Yeah. And that is really annoying. How, how do you mean? I've got something funny, I think. Okay. But there's no gap. Okay. Everyone's kind of back and yeah. forth, back and forth. And, uh, and then the moment passed. Exactly. Yeah. And you can't go back. So that that's frustrating. In a way, I quite like them to do ten minutes filming of me at the top. And I just do all my bits and I can go home. <laughs> Uh, do, you ever, do, uh, do you think you'd ever take Dara's job if it was off the top? As I say, I, don't, I shouldn't Make ever see. Make it a weird. I think it would have to be a different show. Different show. I would say Dara's very good at everything. Mm -hmm. Jokes, pre-written, improvising, being a nice person and saying, no, no, or, and directing the whole boat. It's quite odd. Um, now, your act is based around one-liners. Uh, and I, I did a bit of math, and I kind of worked out a te to deliver a one-liner, it will take you 10 seconds. You've probably got like a 10, maybe 15 second reaction off of the yeah, of that. Or two. Or yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. So um, in like one minute, that's, I think that's, that's four jokes a minute. So if you had like say an 80 minute set, that's 320 jokes. How the hell do you remember all of that? Well, for a start, sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. I leave stuff out. But uh, I tend to remember them in subject chunks. Yeah. So I put all my romance jokes together, I put all my school jokes together. And after I've done it three or four times, then I have a sense of what I might be leaving out or need to put in next. I just practice pretty good. But sometimes, usually I come off stage and go, oh, forgot that bit. Yeah. Which is annoying, but... but I mean, what's the actual process of you remembering? Do you like turn the, the jokes into images or do you just go over them like line by line over and over and over and drill them into yeah, it? Yeah, basically. So, uh, before doing a show, I, I'd look at a list of 300 words and try and remember the order. Oh, so if I gave you a subject right now, could you just roll off a joke off the top of your head? Is your memory that good? Well, it depends what the subject is, but maybe. Uh, let's say, Grandad going to hospital. <laughs> <laughs> That's difficult. <laughs> Here's the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anything about Grandad's is... Uh -huh. About a month before he died, my grandmother covered my grandfather's back with lard and after that he went downhill very quickly. That's that one. There we go. That's <laughs> at least 20 that years old. Yeah. Uh, uh, fish and chips. Mm -hmm. about food or food. Um, I remember my uncle used to take me swimming. He used to climb on his back, go out into the ocean, get a really good look at the fish. Because years before he was attacked by a shark and he'd been fitted with a glass bottom. <laughs> Well, you're good. Let me see if my cameraman can come up with something. Any suggestions on what Milton could do as a joke? Quick subject. Vinegar. Vinegar? That's hard, vinegar. Yeah, that's really hard. Condiments. Um, condiments. Oh, yeah. Awkward, isn't it? When you end up in prison, because you're in a cafeteria, and an old lady was rummaging through the condiments, she said, assault, please. <laughs> bum, bum! Yeah. <laughs> Going like the new Bob Monkhouse, that's what you are. <laughs> um, now, what happened of, of rooms, or house of rooms? House of rooms. Like, Basically, go anywhere, did that get dropped? Yeah. What no, a lot of people liked it, but the lady at the top of Channel 4 didn't. Oh. So that was the end of that. But we're working with something with the BBC at the moment. 
hopefully we get there in the end, but it's a long, slow process, as you know, so yeah. just keep going. What is it? Can you tell us? Can you, can you tell us what it is? Well, I don't know what the title will be. It's me and my dad in a shop. Uh-huh. Um, like an open new hours kind of thing? No. Uh-huh. It's a pound shop, uh-huh. and he wants to put me in charge of it, but I'm incompetent, basically. Uh-huh. So he can't retire. Uh-huh. And it's a little parade of shops. So that's the gist of it. Have you filmed the pilot? Is that no. scheduled in? No. We've, got, we've done two scripts. Two scripts. We've got a reading. So we'll see. In your position, though, it must be really easy to get stuff commissioned. No, it must be. Very funny. Really? Because you know, all, obviously, all the people at the BBC and you've got a really big profile. Everyone knows you. For a start, they all play musical chairs every six months. So uh, yeah, I've found this out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is very annoying. But um, I think people will read what I've written. But then you get into, even if they like it, there's no gap for two years. And can we just have a meeting about this or that and that? And that? Then they change around again. As soon as House of Rooms died, which was three years ago next January, uh-huh. we went into talking about the next one, and we're only at read through level. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's just a slow process. With you putting it together and working with the BBC, do you have any say as to who plays your dad? Do you, can you, oh, yeah. choose, you choose all the casting? You've well, got control. I mean, I wouldn't say I've got control. Unfortunately, my knowledge of casting is a bit limited to stand-ups rather uh-huh. than actors. Uh-huh. And the danger of casting stand-ups is they tend to play themselves. Yeah, but sometimes stand-ups can make yeah, great yeah, transitions, do. really great actors. Yes, they can do. Really surprised by Jack Whitehall, if I'm honest. Yeah, when, he, when he started Bad Education, I was like, that's going to bomb. But one yeah. of my favourite shows right now. Yeah, yeah. No, it is surprising, but I can suggest stuff and they will listen. But they may have a better idea, and to be honest, they might do, you know. So I have to listen to them as well. And how do you put together your, your tours? I know that you were saying before that you start completely from fresh. How do you look for a, a subject to work around? Constantly. Looking at words, ideas, pictures. I'm thinking, what's the worst that could happen in that situation? So, always turning things upside down. And obviously most of it leads to nothing. Yeah. Occasionally, then I go, ah. Ah. And I make a note, and I put myself into a new material night, get all those notes, try and turn them into one-liners. Maybe I did 25 jokes, five work. Another five might work it with a bit more work. Does someone like you ever bomb anymore? Uh, you still bomb? What, compl- I mean, like, completely, you do, like, a five, ten-minute gig, and yeah. there's just silence, awkward silence. I think your definition of death changes as you get more experience. Uh-huh. But I know sometimes in the next six months it'll be a really difficult gig. Probably be a corporate thing, or where they have the microphone doesn't work, or, you know, something really basic. Uh-huh. And I think that's part of being a stand-up, is to learn to live with that. Mm. Just knowing that at some point you'll be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, that's how it is. First gig, good or bad? Did you die or um, did you do well? First open spot died horribly. Died horribly. How long was it until you kind two of... Two years. Two years. So that. you kept dying for two years? No, no, no. I didn't do another gig for two years oh. after that one. Yeah. <laughs> you were that put off. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it went well, well. And then it was okay. And you... I think what you mustn't do is just book one gig in at a time because then you're always measuring yourself about how that gig went yeah. because if you book ten in then you can take a sort of average across them but yeah tiny little gigs also are at the mercy of the loud laughers and you can never you know friends in the audience or whatever it is yeah. you think you're doing really well and then you face a real crowd and oh <laughs> so um, yeah no, it took a long time to get going it takes a long time to find your own voice I think. And so from, from that point, that gig, the way you died, and you had that two-year break, how long was it then that you... Um, how long after that did you win the period? I became best newcomer five years after that. Five years after that. Yeah. So it took a while. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> it took yeah. a while. Yeah. Very good. That's the way it is. And do you get annoyed when you see some comedians who just kind of get a hang of it really naturally and really quickly? Um, I mean, some, of, some of them just kind of it almost like, it's, almost, it's almost like they start and they just they're just good they're just yeah, naturally yeah. good I've been around long enough to know that it goes in cycles some people start really quickly yeah they get to 20 minutes 
and they may not change for 10 years from that point. I mean, literally, words, they, they may be the same. Um, and other people, perhaps more like myself, start slower yeah. and gradually. Gradually yeah. ramp up. I'd say it's hard for kids or people in their 20s because they haven't had the life experience. Mm. And we all started by doing an impression of a comedian rather than actually being a comedian. What was yours? Well, no, not, not even like an impression of someone who existed. Yeah. But like you do, you're almost like a teenager at a party pretending to be bigger than you are. Yeah. And you're a bit like some other people around at the time. Um, which is used, it's like a plant growing up a stick. You know, the, the stick is the established comedian. You, and eventually, hopefully, you go off. Look at the greasy my hands are. Yeah. Um, eventually, you go off and do your own thing. But you b sort of begin on the template of someone else. Yeah. So when you were writing, did you find that you were writing in someone else's voice? Were you writing in the voices of... of when I started, I was writing in a hundred different voices. That was a problem. It wasn't until I developed the idea of the hair and the jumpers, as it was. And did, did your sets become a lot easier after that? Yeah. I'm guessing because people established you very quickly as the, it's the weird, kind of weird guy left field. Yeah, yeah. It acted as a signpost to where I was coming from. Yeah. So that was handy. Gave me another 10 seconds at the top of the show. Uh -huh. While people went, ah, look at this bloke. <laughs> and uh, they expected me to, to say odd stuff from that point on. So that worked really well. Whereas before, sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. Sometimes the jokes weren't consistent. And people would say, you've got good jokes, but I don't know what I'm booking. Mm. It's a bloke with good jokes, so, you know. Um. I guess uh, that, that must have really had you stand out from the crowd back then, because I can't imagine too many people kind of doing that kind of thing. No. Wine shirt, big hair. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was handy. I mean, I had to play around with the level of it, in terms of how stupid it actually was. Oh, it. really? Was there a point where you were too stupid? Yeah, I think I, the hair went too high. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a ruler and measure it? <laughs> Ten centimetres? No, that's not good. Got Actually, bad reaction, five. <laughs> I usually say the thicker the crowd, the higher the hair has to go. Uh -huh. Because they need to be cartooned for them. But uh, I think sometimes I went a bit too far in terms of um, just being too stupid. And then, then that didn't make sense because the jokes were quite clever. Yeah. So it's a fine line. But if someone comes to see me do a radio show or record it, I don't even bother with the hair. Just, they know what As they're in for. Yeah. And tell us about your tour. Temple of Daft. Temple of Daft. So it was like an Indiana Jones person with Milton Jones, Temple of Daft. Uh -huh. And uh, it'll be more of a narrative. But with lots of silly jokes in. Again, nothing heavy, nothing a clever 11 year old won't understand. <laughs> What's the narrative? Well, this I'm still debating. It'd be, it's not going to be an Indiana Jones spoof, but it'll be that kind of a story, uh -huh. probably based in the town I'm in. What and, town is that? Well, no, wherever I am on tour. Oh, I, I see. Okay. So, um, so you make it quite regional. Yeah, yes. And the anti-hero may have the accent of the town. <laughs> <laughs> see where I go. Uh -huh. But to be honest, I haven't finished writing all of it, so it's quite hard to be sp specific. There'll be lots of silly jokes. Actually. Aren't you a bit worried that you've got like a, yeah, a few months until the, the tour kind of kicks in and you haven't got a tour yet? You haven't finished it? You know how it was when you did exams at school? You kind yeah. of had to wait till the last week before going, huh! <laughs> and then you cram it in. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a bit like that. How many open mic spots do you do when you're preparing for a tour? Do you do quite a lot? Yeah, one a week. One a week. Only one a week? You may speed up towards, depending how I'm doing. Yeah. Um, but because if I do 10 minutes, that is 41 lines. Yeah. So I can't really write much more than that in a week. And most of those will fail anyway. So it should be all right. Should be all right. You're doing a few festivals this year as well? Yeah. I, think I heard you're doing the Henley Festival. Henley Festival, Latitude, Reading, Leeds, Camp Festival, several others as well. So yeah, I'm doing quite a lot of festival type thing. Every town that has a marquee and a microphone. A <laughs> You're there, basically. And how are your granddads doing? All 38 of them. Well, some of them have died. Oh. Yeah, but that, that's all in the joke. Uh -huh. um, yeah. 
Yeah, I might leave the granddads for a bit. Oh no! My favourite bit, you can't leave the granddads! We'll see how it goes. Maybe okay. I'll change it to Uncle or something like that. Are oh, you getting tired of the granddads? Is that. Well. Are you getting bored of it? I did open my last tour with me doing granddad. I may do that again. I'm not sure. I may have done it. I might have a different character. You should, you should carry over with the granddad thing. You should. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be upset. I'll, be, I'll cry. I'll come here. I'll get some a big cup of tea. Yeah. I'll cry into my fish and chips if there's no granddad in your new tour. Just for you. Just for me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Mark's out of ten for the fish and chips. We've had some fish now, so you can rate the whole thing. Eight and a half. Eight and a half. Not quite a nine. I'm a very tough taskmaster. Eight and a half is still good. Yeah, it is good. Very good. Cool. Mm. Well, Milton, thank you so much again. Enjoy yeah, the tour, man. Pleasure. Cheers. Thank you.